Okay, well, welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Corman and I have the privilege of being the Executive Director of the UIC Alumni Association. Welcome to the UIC Alumni Exchange Series. Each week, we work to bring you a variety of programs and topics so you can explore, connect, and even escape from the everyday with a community of UIC alumni, faculty, and staff experts. You'll hear me say this a few times today, but I encourage you to visit go uic.edu backslash alumni exchange for the latest and greatest programming. And with that, I'm excited to start our program this afternoon featuring UIC alumnus Dr. Lyle Berkowitz as he presents an interactive discussion covering telehealth, artificial intelligence, computerized sensing, medical drones, and 3D printing, and how all of these may impact your personal health and the healthcare system at large. Thank you so much, Dr. Berkowitz, for being with us here today, and I'll turn it over to you to begin the program. All right, thanks for having me, Karen. Uh, thanks for everybody who's on. Uh, this is gonna be hopefully a fun, interesting um, uh, exchange. Uh, I'm uh, going to talk about a lot of the cool stuff you've been reading about and give you a, a little sense of what's happening from a physician and patient perspective. Uh, and uh, it will be a, a little interactive. We'll have some polls. Uh, we'll definitely have some time for Q&A that you can uh, tee up into the, uh, the chat and Karen will uh, read that to me and we may stop along the way and we'll definitely have some time at, for Q&A at the end as well. Um, but let me go ahead and start uh, with uh, the agenda of what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, it is gonna range um, you know, from uh, a variety of things you're familiar with and maybe a couple you're not familiar with uh, in healthcare. Um, it will go a little in order of things that you probably have heard and know a little more about. Um, but I wanna start with an introduction um, uh, to give you some grounding of where I'm coming from and some of the um, history, experiences, biases I have. Uh, I am a biomedical engineer uh, by uh, undergrad training uh, and I came to UIC med school uh, in the, the late 80s, just as the internet uh, was starting to build and start um, and uh, was fortunate enough to be connected with some amazing mentors. Um, you can go ahead and click Je uh, Jessica. Um, and uh, was able to become part of the University of Illinois College of Medicine uh, computer program, informatics lab, et cetera. The study of how technology and computers would be important in medicine and I, uh, studied that for four years alongside of being in medicine. Uh, we now have a more formal program at UIC College of Medicine on, on that topic, which I love to see and, and think that there's a lot of greatness that our doctors and med students are gonna be able to do. Uh, when I left med school, I went to Northwestern Medicine and spent about 25 years there. I did my uh, residency in internal medicine, primary care, I was a primary care physician there for many years but I additionally wound up uh, being a physician executive uh, on the informatics technology side, rolling out electronic medical records and other technologies, um, but eventually started the innovation program. Uh, you can click Jessica. And uh, in uh, that, it was a, uh, initially a, a nonprofit donation that got things started. Um, I was able to become a member of a national group called the Innovation Learning Network wrote a book uh, on the intersection of technology and innovation um, and uh, eventually started uh, a small special practice um, focusing on precision medicine and healthcare. Um, and so have been very fortunate over the years um, to be involved in, uh, in an academic medical center doing innovative things, but also I've been able to work uh, externally in a variety of businesses, um, a variety of technology businesses that usually focus on a theme of how do we automate uh, and virtualize the care experience to make life both better for patients and for physicians at the same time? So what are we gonna be talking about today? Uh, the future is, as they say, sometimes easy to predict what will happen, um, but we don't always know when it's gonna happen. Uh, I have a couple of, of these cartoons that are literally over 100 years old um, uh, that look at what might the future look like? Uh, and as you can see, uh, some of these um, have started coming true. Um, electronic scrubbing, hey, you know, that uh, we, we have the Roomba. Um, I love this one of, in the lower left side, 
which is a bunch of kids getting fed books. This is sort of the internet uh, in its own way. Um, interestingly, the barber hasn't changed that much, but I bet it will eventually. In the lower right hand, is this what the future of medicine is like, that we'll be able to automate, robot, roboticize, et cetera, to the point where we only use humans if there's an emergency? Um, and perhaps, and that's one of the themes I've had in my career, I often say, we don't have a shortage of physicians as much as we have a shortage of using them efficiently. And if we look at every other industry, from entertainment to travel, um, you know, to you know, so many different types of um, commerce, et cetera, they all have really m been able to take better advantage of technologies in a variety of ways um, to um, make it more efficient and cost effective. And I, I do believe we'll get there in healthcare. But today we're gonna talk about some things that do that and some sort of cool, interesting things as well um, that, uh, that may be affecting our lives. Get to the next slide. I just wanna talk for a minute why this is so important. <clears throat> just to remind everybody, um, we have the best healthcare in the world uh, if you can afford it uh, and if you can get it. Uh, but in America, you know, this, this slide from a couple of years ago, it's uh, still uh, similar, shows that we spend you know, per capita, per person, much more than anybody else on healthcare. And yet, our life expectancy is significantly less. And there's a variety of reasons, of course, um, lifestyle being a big one, uh, but also in, in inequality of who can get the, the best care, uh, as well as um, you know, things like um, you know, uh, early life, life expectancy, et cetera. But clearly, we're not getting um, the bang for our money that we should there's still a lot of work to be done. And on the next slide, um, I wanna just talk a little about you know, how to think uh, about innovation, how I think about it. And you know, the, the uh, classic line is um, you know, when Henry Ford uh, talked about, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, not a car. You have to think a little differently. Seth Godin uh, takes that step further. You know, Email's more than faxing. You know, online is more than a whiteboard. Facebook is more than a Rolodex. Um, and encourage us to play a new game. Not the old game, but faster. So some of what we're gonna be talking about is gonna be quite disruptive uh, and different than what we are, not simply a, a newer version of what we've done in the past. In healthcare, there are lots of, uh, of people who talk about new things, but I'll, you know, I'll harken back a hundred years ago, again, to um, uh, William Mayo, one of the Mayo brothers, um, who talked about you know, the glory of medicine is that's constantly moving forward, always trying to improve uh, what we're doing. Um, and uh, click once more. Um, and then he said something really interesting. Uh, and that is the aim of medicine, of course, is to prevent disease and, and prolong life. But the ideal of medicine is to eliminate the need of a physician. Uh, it's a fascinating concept, but one that is used day in and day out at all the big companies, Apple, Amazon, et cetera, every company, you know, I've been on the technology side, you go to the engineers and say, your job every day is to eliminate um, the need for you, you know, is to try and automate and improve technology and do things to get to the point where you don't need you in your current sense, and then you come up with the next problem. Um, so again, I think uh, Dr. Mayo here is, uh, is ahead of his time, um, but when we start thinking about it from that perspective, uh, I, you know, I all often refer to what I call my sad philosophy to make doctors happy and patients healthy. And that is how do you simplify, automate, and delegate routine activities? Um, because for physicians, we really want to make sure they're used to the, the height of their license. So much of what I'm going to be talking about falls under that general umbrella of how do we um, take the routine things uh, and uh, expert systems, et cetera, and figure out how to do what every other industry does which is how do you automate, how do you provide self-service, how do you uncover things that were not known before so that the experts can focus on the things that they're best at. So uh, enough of sort of that big overview. Um, what might the future of healthcare look like? There are a variety of um, infographics around. You can click again, Jessica. But you know, what we, we see and hear a lot is how do we use technology to better diagnose uh, and better treat uh, and better predict. Um, and so those are the common themes that we'll see. Uh, it's interestingly, even a couple of years ago, you know, uh, on uh, what people thought might happen the next five years um, and what might happen next 25 years, you'll notice telemedicine uh, is 
uh, up until a couple months ago was thought of as something that is going to be farther in the future. But with COVID, um, it jumped quickly um, to the uh, to the lead uh, in what we're doing. And we're going to talk a, a bit about that for sure. Uh, is one of my experiences uh, was uh, helping lead one of the larger telehealth companies in the nation uh, for the past couple of years um, until I retired from there in January. Uh, next slide. Uh, we're going to start, um, like I said, being a little interactive, and we're going to give you a sample poll here and asking you, uh, what's your age bracket? Um, uh, this is just to give us a sense of, uh, of how to use these polls, but also sort of interesting uh, for everyone to sort of see uh, uh, what, uh, what ages we're, we're working with here. I love that there's uh, uh, 21 and under. Um, maybe that's my daughter who signed on. Uh, let's see. Dr. Berkowitz, as the results are coming in, um, we've had a few people chat saying that they are having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. So I don't know if it's possible to move up a microphone or. Um... Let's see. I will try and keep talking louder. I'm sort of on the microphone. I'll move a little closer here. I hope that is going to be okay for them. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, so we are we able to share the results? Does everybody see the results, Karen? Yes, everybody should be able to see the results. Okay, so it looks like we've got you know a pretty good distribution, uh, mainly from 30 on up, um, but a couple of folks in their 20s as well. And we'll do some more of those um, uh, some more of those later uh, to uh, uh, to get your sense of what you think about the future of healthcare. So let's start with telehealth. Telehealth is, of course, one of the hottest areas out there. It can mean a number of things. Um, Jessica, you can keep clicking on this, on this one, but I wanted to sort of point out um, the first part of telehealth is what we talk about with respect to virtual urgent care. You're sick, uh, you're able to talk to a doctor quickly. Um, we're starting to see primary and specialty care, chronic care uses as well. Uh, and this slot, this, uh, at the bottom, you'll see the dramatic increase uh, that started at the end of March, uh, right? Traditionally, telehealth, and this is by measures of who's been billing, um, has been relatively uh, low amount, um, under 1%. Uh, it peaked at over 50% uh, in April and is now falling into close to 20% of all visits are being done by telehealth. And that's billed visits. There's also, of course, a lot of telehealth that may not be billed. But we've set a new standard um, you know, that we expected to happen over the next couple of years quickly happen as we've seen what I call the, the three R's coalesce. Uh, reimbursement has increased uh, and has become um, on parallel to office visits. Uh, number two, re uh, the um, regulatory statutes have freed up uh, and this is both at a national and state level, making telehealth a lot easier to do in a variety of ways. And third, I'll call regularity, is that doctors and patients are now used to this. It's become more of a regular part of practice. And I think that we'll see moving forward um, a new baseline in the 20 to 30% range, maybe a little more for certain specialties like psychiatry, maybe a little less for other specialties uh, such as um, surgeons, et cetera, who may um, need to see somebody in, in the office. Um, although surgeons and other procedure specialists often will do a lot of telehealth, it's just not being billed as part of their bundled group. Um, and the next slide, though, I want to talk a little more uh, about some examples. Uh, and this is the current, uh, you know, typical example you'll see is a face to face video visit um, or phone visit. Um, but also wanted to point out. Uh, that we're starting to see asynchronous type care uh, rise as well. Uh, and that's where you just do texting and or fill out some forms. And the truth is you don't necessarily need to see a doctor every time you have a simple problem. Uh, and the lower right hand side, we see Lavango, Chicago company, um, who's doing chronic disease management and they're bringing a little more automation uh, and they're doing ongoing care. So it's not just urgent care. And that the upper side we see um, some of the concepts of doing second opinions online, et cetera. 
So telehealth is much more than just, I have a cold or I, I might have COVID. Um, it's expanding very quickly beyond urgent care uh, to chronic care, preventive care, second opinions, et cetera. But in the next slide, I wanna also point out that the concept, the bigger concept of virtual care involves telehealth in which I would view as um, a patient and doctor communicating online to autonomous health. And autonomous health um, involves some level of, you know, could be a chat bot or other autonomous care that is able to help direct, to triage, um, pre-diagnose, get some intake, et cetera, for both urgent, chronic, preventive care, et cetera. I think we're gonna be seeing much more of this. Again, this falls into the, how do we make care more efficient? It's not, uh, we don't simply wanna replace a 15 minute office visit with a 15 minute video visit. Um, we believe uh, that a lot of what can be done by the doctor now or is being done by the doctor can and should be done uh, by automated assistance, uh, quite honestly, similar to Amazon. Uh, you don't go to Amazon and have a video visit with a bookseller in Seattle. It's mostly self-service, it's mostly automated, but if and when you need to escalate to a person, they'll let you do that. Similarly, I think we'll see that in healthcare as well, um, and particularly for a lot of care that is very routine. So my hunch is a lot of you have done telehealth over the past couple of months, uh, and so I have a question for you. The next slide is, uh, we're gonna talk about the poll, is based on your experiences to date, uh, do you think that you will utilize telehealth on a regular basis in the next five years? That a majority of your care will be done by telehealth. Um, you can also answer that you really don't, haven't done telehealth, don't have any experience to work with, um, but I'm curious um, uh, what people are thinking. So it looks like by and large, uh, there's a lot of folks who definitely yes and are likely. Um, a couple who are unlikely, um, definitely no. And, and then about 15% uh, who haven't had experience with telehealth. And that's about right. We're certainly seeing um, uh, people in the um, 60, 70% range who've used telehealth uh, in the past, um, uh, past uh, year. Um, so uh, this is, you know, sort of makes sense. Telehealth's an easy one. Now we're gonna talk about some harder ones or ones that are probably a little less likely. So precision medicine. Um, precision medicine um, uh, is, uh, the next slide, is a combination of um, different things that can help with diagnosis and treatment. I think most people think about it as uh, what we'll call you know, genomics, what your DNA uh, is and what therefore provides some level of risk or disease that you might have. Um, but genomic or precision medicine actually goes beyond that. Um, it includes uh, everything all the way to uh, proteomics and um, uh, metabolomics. Uh, because the genome, your DNA, which is in your genome, actually will create a variety of proteins, which then creates um, uh, metabolites. And each of those can be different in a variety of ways. And your phenotype, what you actually express, uh, can be is going to be based on both your genome, but a variety of other environmental and other factors um, that will make each of you unique. But let's talk about genetics first on the next slide, uh, genomics specifically. So you've heard of 23andMe, most likely. Ancestry has some ACTX as a more medical specific um, uh, service. Uh, and this gives you a little idea of what you can find with genomics. Um, you can find your ancestry, interesting. You can find traits you're likely to have, blue eyes, dark curly hair, et cetera. Um, on the medical side though, is, is of course what uh, has become interesting. Um, there's uh, pharmacogenomics, um, predicting how you'll respond to certain meds, which blood pressure, antidepressants, et cetera, you're more likely to respond to what you might have side effects for what type of dose um, of medicine you should be on. Uh, it can predict risk factors, uh, your likelihood of developing heart disease, um, Alzheimer's, et cetera. Um, and um, that can, of course, be balanced. You might have certain genes that increase your risk, others that decrease your risk, but it may uh, allow you to understand how to improve your lifestyle. Similar to carrier status, um, 
this is something that uh, determines whether or not you might have a gene that you can pass on, uh, even if it's not affecting you. Um, so there's lots of interesting things that we're doing with genomics. Um, by and large, it's mainly in the diagnosis um, stage, but also can help, yeah, uh, help us predict um, what you're at risk for, how to check your lifestyle, and what medicines you might use. But a little more interesting in genomics, or, or a little more significant, is the impact potential on cancer um, uh, is there are now ways to detect um, cancer, early cancer, not just risk for cancer, but actual cancer in your bloodstream by looking for little fragments of cancer DNA. Um, the company Grail has been one of the most prominent in this area. Uh, they pointed out with this interesting infographic uh, just a couple months ago that because of COVID, we're seeing a lot less people get typical screenings, um, your mammograms, pap smears, colonoscopies, et cetera. Uh, and uh, it may make the importance of getting a blood test uh, even more. If you click on the next, um, uh, there we go. So Grail, which by the way, just got bought this week for $7 billion um, uh, because of their uh, potential ability to use blood, uh, blood tests for early cancer detection. Um, it is not out yet, but you know, the potential is high, uh, is, is one way to do it. You may have heard of Cologuard. That has become a new standard for colon cancer screening, uh, where you actually provide a stool sample, mail it in, um, and they look for fragments of colon cancer DNA. So what's happening is cancers will release what they call uh, free DNA into your bloodstream, and that's what these companies are looking for. So precision medicine now is starting to look not just at risk, but also whether you currently have disease. On the next slide, I wanna talk about something else I've, I've learned a lot about in the past year, working with a company called Soma Logic, and this is around proteomics. And remember, your genes will eventually create proteins that then help both predict and control um, how you feel, uh, and this idea that People can have the same genotype, the same gene, but a different phenotype, what you express. Uh, and the um, important part here is that can um, help us understand everything from how you respond to certain medications um, to um, potential early uh, risk factor analysis. If you give us one more click, Jessica, the, um, uh, this gives you a sense of what this particular company is able to do, everything from predicting your risk of heart disease to understanding what your body fat percentage is um, and uh, glucose tolerance, et cetera. A lot of biometric and risk factors. Again, we're gonna see more and more blood tests um, uh, doing uh, what Grail does is we call liquid biopsy. Uh, what Soma Logic does is called uh, a, sort of a, a liquid um, uh, annual exam. But blood tests that will be able to very specifically tell us exactly what is going on with your body be a fascinating way and a better way for us to understand a lot of um, uh, risk factors and disease. The last um, precision medicine um, concept I want to talk about is gene therapy. This is huge potential. The idea here is if you have a defective gene that we find in, uh, uh, via genomics um, that can cause a disease um, and or um, there's also ability to uh, get a new gene in you from a virus, et cetera. Um, gene therapy allows us to go in and replace with a healthy gene. Um, it can, of course, be an amazing benefit to people. If you click on the next slides, um, a couple of example is, can a shock cure heart disease? Um, a company uh, that's looking at HIV cures, as well as genetic diseases like um, PKU, as well as cancer. Um, they're also looking at Alzheimer's, variety of other genetic issues like immune deficiencies, hereditary blindness. Sooner or later, you know, these are going to be ways that we cure. This is where we're really getting into um, this concept of changing um, our biology um, to improve in a, in a radically significant way. So let's go to the next. Um, topic, uh, and that's the Internet of Things. IoT, very common. We have in every aspect of life, but becoming increasingly important is a part of sensors and healthcare. I want to talk about three parts of IoT. Um, 
uh, and because sensors in healthcare are going to be extremely important to for early detection, feedback, etc. Um, and right now, they often are things that we have to manually do. But sooner or later, um, you may never be offline. Um, but let's look at what we have right now. In the next slide, uh, we'll look at um, wearables. I think the most obvious one is the Apple iPhone. Um, uh, which is now doing some amazing things. It's getting your EKG, looking for atrial fibrillation. It's getting your oxygen level, your pulse, of course, um, whether you've taken a fall. Um, but there are, also, there are other ones out there as well in the wearable concept. Uh, there's a PAX here to your left uh, that can actually follow a variety of physiological measurements. Um, there's wearable electronic sweat sensor detectors, um, even the ability to draw electronics on, screen, on, on your skin um, to, um, uh, to sense a number of things. So there's a fascinating number of what we'll call wearables out there uh, that then will uh, be able to um, send a message to your iPhone perhaps and to uh, maybe a central server to again, track to start with early detection. Um, so perhaps you want to put something on uh, an elderly relative so that you know if they fall, if their oxygen level is going down, if their pulse level is going up, um, these are ways for us to know things even before they may happen um, in many ways. The next slide talks goes from wearables to ingestibles. This is actually where you can swallow a pill um, and it can measure um, a variety of fluids or uh, other things in your intestine. Uh, and that can then send a message to your phone, to a larger server. Um, there's a, a uh, another one called the capsule ultrasound, which is actually a camera. A and they can actually view uh, your small intestine, your stomach, for example, in cases where the endoscopy, the, the scope, can't reach a certain place or for some reason it's uh, not amenable. So ingestibles are also an important aspect of IoT, which are being used now, but I think we'll see more of them as well. And the, the final slide um, is what we'll call the implantables. Um, and uh, I uh, of course, di for diabetics, the ability to have something that can sense your glucose and affect your insulin is great. And then you all probably recently read about Elon Musk's newest company, Neuralink, which is literally putting a chip in your brain um, to help um, uh, communicate, to help improve uh, memory, uh, intelligence, et cetera. Um, these things seem wild and scary now. We've been talking about them for a while, but um, they are going to happen uh, in a variety of ways. And it may start out as helping someone who's paralyzed, but it may eventually get to the point where it can help all of our memories um, and uh, processing ability in a, in a better way. Um, and it's interesting to think it, right now, a lot of people, of course, would say, I'd never do that. Um, and yet, um, you know, a lot of people probably said at some point they would never inject themselves with something. They might never get a uh, replacement of, uh, uh, of their knee, et cetera, many years ago. So we'll see uh, what eventually happens here. Okay, next topic. Uh, and actually, let me stop there, Karen. Any questions or thoughts that come up uh, on the, uh, the previous two topics that we want to stop and, and ask a question or two? I, I think you, you're good to keep going and we can hold till the end. Okay. Thank you. So the next couple of topics are a little more far, uh, farther out. Um, but interesting, still being used today. I just wanted to touch on them. Uh, one is drones. Um, uh, we have all heard about drones. We see Walmart and Amazon starting to deliver drones. Where can they be used in healthcare? Um, I like this infographic. It shows three major categories, search and rescue, of course, um, to be able to find um, uh, somebody, something, et cetera, and uh, ideally be able to transport or deliver. Um, it can be you know, a village that needs medications, um, but there's also this AED delivery. I love this picture, right? A drone that drops a defibrillator. A recent study came out that shows, you know, drones can get to someone faster uh, by a couple of minutes, and that can mean the difference between uh, uh, life and death. Um, uh, but imagine um, being able to have enough drones around the city uh, that can deliver a defibrillator to anyone within five minutes. Um, this other, uh, uh, picture is a, a company I started working with uh, called Valkyrie has a mailbox uh, for drone deliveries because when you're delivering certain things, medications, supplies, etc., you're not just going to drop them on someone's front porch. 
and hope they find it. Uh, there needs to be a secure chain of control. Um, within a hospital, you may deliver something from uh, point A to point B in a hospital. Uh, hospitals are large. It can be you know, a 10, 20 minute walk for someone. A drone can deliver it in one to two minutes. Uh, again, can mean the, the difference um, between life and death and can be a lot more efficient and cost effective. Uh, and of course, drones are also being used to support telemedicine um, when you need to um, get something to somebody quickly. So I think um, this is something that is going to become more and more popular in general. Uh, and I think we're gonna see a lot of healthcare applications. The next one uh, we're gonna talk about uh, in the next slide is 3D printing. Sort of a cool thing that you know your kids may be making uh, some type of figure for Dungeons and Dragons, but think about uh, what we've seen in healthcare, um, prosthetics and medical devices, being able to be customized um, and done a lot more cheaply. Personalized surgery, being able to print out what exactly you're gonna see when you cut open somebody and be able to plan the surgery better. And of course, the most interesting things is being able to use 3D printing, not using plastic, not using metal, but using you know, some type of organic tissue to actually build organs. Um, this is being studied right now in a variety of places. Um, and yeah, maybe not the heart right away, but things like uh, in, uh, liver and other, uh, and other organs, they're actually studying how they could do this um, and build something up using uh, the patient's own stem cells, et cetera, on a framework um, that might come from a, a variety of places, animals and or plastic, um, but it's an, a fascinating place to study. Okay, next one. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, is nanobots. Nanobots, uh, of course, in the next slide, are tiny devices, nano, um, that can be um, injected into bloodstream. And this is the stuff of fantasy, um, the, you know, the 1960s movie um, um, that uh, looked at being injected into somebody. But it's real. It's actually a machine uh, that can go, it can, as simple as getting some um, diagnoses, um, by measuring the compounds, um, but more complex nanobots are actually able to support surgery um, uh, using uh, magnets. Um, in this example, they talk about eye surgeries, clearing out blocked arteries, collecting biopsies, um, and then finally delivering um, chemicals, um, chemotherapy, et cetera, directly to a cancer cell, um, to a virus, et cetera. Um, there are going to be a number of interesting things. I've um, uh, there's even theories and philosophies about um, using nanobots to essentially, you know, correct major deficiencies, um, you know, structural deficiencies uh, that may have come from an injury or that may have come from simply aging. Um, this could be eventually, you know, the solution to some aspects of aging, uh, to um, being able to treat things that were always considered untreatable. Uh, and then the, I think the, uh, the next uh, discussion is sort of the big discussion uh, around AI. Um, uh, we talk about artificial intelligence, uh, but also the term that's probably more accepted is augmented intelligence. Um, but the question is how much do we replace? Uh, how much do we um, support adoption? This is a, just a, a little infographic on uh, how it can be used in the pharmaceutical space um, to find, identify um, certain molecules, et cetera, that might be effective um, uh, in certain situations to, of course, supporting clinical trials, to helping decide which medication to take. Um, and then the diagnostics, of course, being one of the more interesting areas, um, the most obvious being imaging areas such as radiology, pathology, um, dermatology. Uh, in this case, uh, we have an example of how AI can improve uh, the radiology process all the way from initial acquisition and reconstruction and visualization to analyzing and detecting things. Um, you know, some of the, the coolest companies out there using AI are now looking at uh, helping a radiologist who may have to look at hundreds of X, you know, CTs, mammograms, et cetera. And before they look at them, uh, the computer, the AI is able to help figure which are the very low risk cases, things that you don't have to spend a lot of time on, and which are the high risk ones, things that look like they may have something important. So you're not replacing the radiologist, but you're certainly 
augmenting their ability. You're letting them focus on the areas that are most important. You're letting them be much more efficient um, and decreasing the chance that they'll miss something. So I think that concept is gonna be really important. Um, and the truth is at some point, it may get to the point where it's replacing the radiologist, at least for the routine cases and only getting them involved in maybe more complex cases um, that are edge cases. And I think we can see that obviously in radiology, pathology and dermatology where there's imaging, but I'd like to think that we, that same analogy can and should apply to uh, the um, cognitive skills as well um, as an internist. Um, if you're dealing with someone who has a sinus infection, uh, it's not hard to diagnose a sinus infection. That's easy. Where AI would come into play is understanding what of those 100 patients with typical sinus infections, if any of those have something that might be a little different, a little unusual that deserves a doctor spending 10, 15 minutes talking to them some more. That's where we'll really get into, I think, the appropriate use of AI in the cognitive areas. Um, and as I think the visual areas will certainly be leading um, the charge. Go to the next slide. Um, you know, I think we're gonna hear a lot about, um, again, how far will we go with AI? Um, this concept um, of, you know, are we gonna replace the doctors, um, et cetera? I, again, I, I found yet another cartoon from like a hundred years ago. Uh, you can tell because the doctor is like smoking a cigarette in this, um, right? But he is now just you know, looking at uh, you know, everything online and the system's ideally telling them and perhaps um, identifying to them which patient is the one that needs him most. Uh, a typical primary care doctor may manage two to 2,500 2, patients, um, but really does he need to see every one of them? You know, how do we start thinking about what every other um, industry has done and saying, maybe the, the doctor only needs to see a small portion of those patients Maybe we can use all of these technologies to allow him to automate some of the process, delegate to a lower level of care, um, uh, and virtualize uh, as much as possible so that the patients that need to get seen face-to-face -face are truly the ones that need it. Um, so that's a challenge that we have. I, I clearly have not gone over every single new thing that's going on in healthcare, but I want to give you a bit of an idea and some thinking about some of the cool things that are happening, uh, how they might impact us, how they're working now, et cetera. And le let me, let me um, ask another question here. Uh, in this poll, I wanna ask you, what do you think uh, you will experience in the next five years? Of the topics that we discuss, the poll is gonna say, which of these do you think you will experience in the next five years? Clearly, uh, most of you have already said telehealth, but of the others as well, um, what do you think? Click on each of those things that you believe you will personally experience uh, in the next five years. Okay, we'll give you a couple, another minute or so. We've got about, um, actually over 65% of you have voted. I love this poll and we can see a lot of things. So this looks like a pretty progressive group. Uh, most of you, of course, feel telehealth, but you know, over half of you also, precision medicine, internet of things, and artificial intelligence. Uh, you're a little less uh, likely to think you'll experience drones, nanobots, and 3D printing, although over you know, in general, 20 plus percent of you think you will. Um, so I think that's really interesting uh, and helpful to see. Um, I didn't ask you whether or not you'd have your uh, chip implanted in your brain. I think that's a, um, uh, one that gets a lot of good responses as well. And we can talk a little more about that if you want. Um, but let's, uh, um, let's move on to a little wrap up. So what do I think you're gonna, we should expect? What will the future of healthcare look like? Um, first of all, I think this concept of the tricorder, you might remember from Star Trek, at least our uh, folks who are uh, uh, over 40, um, this idea that a single device um, can help immediately diagnose, detect, et cetera. Um, and that might be a combination of biometric labs and imaging. It may include something that you're wearing or ingesting. 
artificial intelligence, right? It combines a couple of these things that we've talked about, IoT, um, um, nanobots, AI, et cetera. Um, in the ambulatory space, of course, it can predict and prevent. It can follow you around on a regular basis, um, as well as help prevent um, uh, with early detection. At the hospitals, of course, um, you know, it may be tracking um, you and a variety of objects uh, around um, and help additionally prevent and predict earlier than normal. Second big area topic, this concept of a robo-doc. How much will we replace doctors? I think we will see a replacement of routine repeatable care. Again, things like sinus infections and UTIs and cough, a lot of that stuff is very routine transactional, um, uh, evidence-based, um, black and white care, um, even main, uh, managing someone with stable blood pressure, diabetes. Uh, I think we'll see certainly technically the ability for a computer to do a, a pretty good job at that. Uh, we'll need regulatory change, um, but I think we'll get there as well. And then augmenting doctors. This is for the people at the top of the pyramid. You know, the, if you look at the 80-20 rule, 80% of care may be replaceable, but 20% you'll still need doctors working in conjunction. Uh, the, the famous line that's been said by a number of people is, we're not going to replace a doctor uh, necessarily, um, but doctors who don't use um, artificial intelligence, et cetera, will be replaced by doctors who do use that. Um, and so I think you'll see that being incorporated more and more. And finally, this concept of biohacking, whether that is uh, um, giving you an implant uh, in some way, uh, cyborg, as they say, this idea of gene editing and cures, nanotechnology um, that can control things at a cellular level. Uh, we didn't even talk about stem cells, but regenerative medicine, et cetera. I think we're going to see these three concepts um, come into play um, over the next couple of years. Um, and I, I will finish with the idea that, um, again, another uh, famous uh, aphorism in the, in the next slide is uh, Amara's Law. And uh, that, uh, oh, actually, uh, uh, sorry, one, one last thing. Um, this is the challenge that we have. Um, uh, how much can we replace? Um, what happens if we actually do cure certain diseases? What happens if we live longer? These are the things that will get us there. Um, and then we do have some ethical and philosophical issues uh, that we will have to face at some point. Um, and again, my predictions are that these things will happen. Uh, when they will happen uh, is the, the magic of being a, a futurist, so to speak. Uh, we don't always know when, um, but if you look at the next slide, um, uh, is Amara's law uh, is the, the famous line that we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate its effect in the long run. Uh, so when you ask people, what do you think will happen in the next five years, uh, sometimes that can get overestimated. But if you look out 10, 15 plus years, we often underestimate what can happen. The iPhone being a great example. A lot of people thought you know, you know, when it came out you know, over 10 years ago that how this is going to change things overnight. It took a while, but what we've accomplished with the internet, the iPhone, et cetera, has of course been more than what people ever thought. Um, would have eventually happened, um, but uh, I would suggest the same things for much of what we're talking about. Some things that we're, we're squarely in now, telehealth, precision medicine is being used. Um, many of the other things, I think we'll be continuing to build those up, um, and some of them may break through sooner than later, um, but almost certainly, as they say, there are very few new ideas. It's about execution, um, and as you saw some, some, some of the old cartoons, most of the ideas I presented uh, are in some way or fashion have been talked about for over 100 plus years, um, but we are getting close to executing on some of them now. So it's going to be a very exciting time in healthcare. Uh, I hope this has been helpful to you. I'll, I'll stop my formal uh, presentation and go to the last slide. Uh, and Karen, um, you want to give us some questions that came up? Yes. Well, thank you so much. This has been incredibly informative and fascinating. Uh, we did have a couple of questions come in. So let me start with, is there any indication on how, on how willing insurance companies will be able to cover newer diagnostic techniques? The person says, if they recall, telehealth was not fully accessible for many at the start of COVID-19 because insurance companies were apprehensive to cover it. Yeah, it, it will be a bit case by case. By case. Um, 
new things are hard. Uh, insurance companies are very wary of um, paying for something new until there's evidence that's clear that it's effective um, from a quality and clinical standpoint and that's cost effective. Uh, so uh, as we go down that list, telehealth right now is at parity. We're hopeful that that remains. There's not a 100% guarantee. The government's actually been pretty good about leading that way. So looking at what CMS, Medicare, Medicaid does is gonna be extremely important. Um, the uh, precision medicine is, you know, it's hit or miss is depending on what your, which parts your insurance will pay for. The more it becomes clear and effective, the better. But like a lot of things, some of this is absolutely gonna start um, uh, with people paying out of pocket for something they view as valuable. Um, also, what will be important is that the ultimate um, um, uh, person at risk will also need to decide. So as we move from a fee-for-service type of system to more value-based care, uh, if you look at your, your Kaisers of the world, um, U of I itself has a large ACO or HMO type of presence, um, they, the provider, will get to decide what gets paid for and whether or not it makes sense, for example, to screen their patients um, for certain, with precision medicine, genomics or proteomics, uh, whether to use a drone because that is more effective than having a person run something from point A to point B, um, uh, whether 3D printing is gonna support their orthopedic or transplant department um, because they're already getting paid a certain amount. They actually will be the ones who are making the decisions as well. And I think that'll be important to see the more innovative places um, pushing and trying new things. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, thank you. So another question. Will a nanobot be able to remove artery plaque so it does not reach the actual bloodstream? So um, just to uh, level everybody up, um, the, you know, the typical plaque in a coronary artery, for example, is going to build up over time. And the issue is whether that either builds up so much it closes the artery or um, uh, more scary is when it ruptures immediately. Uh, so there's certainly theories that a um, the nanobot could go in um, and could perhaps compress um, in some ways that plaque. Could it go in and remove it? Yeah, I'm not the expert there, but theoretically, all those things would be possible. That is, the things that are done at cellular level. Um, uh, I wouldn't want to be the first one that uh, is experimented on, um, but uh, it certainly is in the realm of possibility. Mm, fascinating. Uh, another question across everything you talked about is, do you think these technologies will leave marginalized communities behind? Uh, yes and no. Um, you know, the initially, I think a lot of these things will be more available uh, to um, the patients who have access to the best uh, medical centers or using the latest innovative techniques. Uh, and some of it may be out of pocket. But eventually, um, these same technologies are going to be able to support. Um, so for example, I mean, the easiest one is telehealth. There's no question telehealth has been able to bring care to marginalized rural communities, et cetera, who may not have had it before. Drones, you could argue the same thing. Um, and a proteomic or genomic blood test is much easier to do than some other type of sophisticated uh, testing that involves a big machine. So long-term, uh, this, you know, you can imagine a drone delivering a box to a small town um, or a poor area in that box, the, the local medical assistant is able to um, perform a variety of, of tests, et cetera, and send it back in. Or just on your, your phone and device, we're starting to see um, fascinating things uh, where uh, using the phone's camera, uh, you're able to get uh, immediate uh, vital signs, blood pressure, oxygen level, um, pulse, and eventually temperature. Using artificial intelligence on how and where you use the phone, again, assuming you have a smartphone, which is um, not going to be everybody, but a lot of people, even lower socioeconomic status folks, uh, may have a smartphone, and there are going to be things built in that will be smaller, easier, et cetera. Nanobots, wearables, et cetera, they will get cheaper and easier. And mm -hmm. so those things will be able to help because the truth is, our biggest barrier right now often um, are that people don't have the time or ability to go in and see a doctor. So the more that we can automate and virtualize a level of care and make it easily available, 
um, the better that's going to be for, for everybody of all socioeconomic statuses. Great, thank you. Um, next question, uh, and I apologize if I mispronounce this word. How do you see aptamers? Is that the correct saying? A-P-T-A-M-E-R-S, aptamers, is being useful for just diagnostics or as therapeutics as well? Uh, so that's a, a, yeah, a, a whole different topic, so I'm not an expert in that, so okay. I'll, I'm going to uh, use my pass card on that one. No, that's great, considering I didn't know how to say the word precisely. So, <laughs> so we'll pass together, it's perfect. Um, and different question, how will the rise of telehealth change how healthcare organizations operate and invest in the medium term future? The person continues to say, for example, will they reduce their physical footprints, change physician compensation and incentives, and add more advanced practice providers to triage? That was a lot, so. Yeah, but it's a great question. It's really important. It will change the fabric of what we traditionally do, right? A typical hospital has built up a lot of buildings um, and that's where they have the doctors and that's where the patients have to come. Um, Don Berwick, a very well-known famous doctor started the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the CMS administrator for a while, would often call this concept the tyranny of the office visit. That, you know, we talk about being patient-centric and yet Everyone has to come in to the grand hooba, the doctors, the hospital system, et cetera. Telehealth starts to radically change that. Um, what we're seeing already um, is uh, that uh, hospitals are recognizing they don't need to have so many facilities when telehealth can support, um, that they can have, uh, and, and doctors can work from home, by the way, which turns out they love a lot more and realize as I've interviewed and talked with doctors from all sorts of um, facilities over the past several months, I was actually surprised to find out how many enjoyed the ability to work from home a couple days a week. Um, they're not tied to their offices. So I think what we will see uh, is actually um, a decreased expansion. Um, I think we'll see certain offices shutting down um, and that's sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, uh, and certainly we'll see them used more efficiently, meaning instead of four doctors, maybe there'll be six, doc six doctors who can rotate through those offices. Um, Maybe we'll set up offices that are designated as sort of way stations. So instead of um, just having doctors there, they'll have a variety of other things so people can still go in. They can maybe even do the telehealth visits from there. But I think we will see some reduction in physical footprint. Uh, I think physicians' compensation traditionally has still been RVU based. Um, as long as uh, telehealth is being paid on parity, um, it shouldn't affect them significantly. They may be able to see more people actually. Um, so it may actually improve um, if they're being paid on um, value-based metrics. Uh, it actually may allow them to take care of people more easily. The truth is when uh, I was in and uh, had HMO patients back in the 90s, um, a lot of times we, we were happy to do uh, telephone-based calls. Uh, and then actually the patient was happier. They would get quicker care. They would get good care from their doctor. Uh, so it's um, uh, being able to do timely care uh, is actually very important. Um, more APPs to triage. I don't know. I think actually we'll see triage being more automated, but I do see more APPs in primary care. I think that we will see the uh, that we will see a shift of doctors out of primary care. I think the uh, over the years internal medicine doctors have been split up uh, into hospitalists, so the complex patients in the hospitals and outpatient care where we used to do both. The next split I think will be, there'll be doctors who are virtualists who simply do online virtual care. Uh, when I was with a telehealth company that we had doctors who were full-time dedicated to that. And at the same time, I think we'll start seeing a split to what we'll call complexologists. So primary care internal medicine docs who have a panel size that goes from 2000 down to maybe 200. Um, and these are the companies that are out there, Oak Street, Chen Med, uh, et cetera, who are seeing very, sick people, Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera. And they're seeing the top of the pyramid appropriately and that we'll see more and more routine primary care go to APPs, uh, go to robo, you know, robo docs, et cetera. Mm, that would be you. my prediction. Yeah, thank you for that comprehensive look. I think it's going to be, going back to your second chart, the second to last chart, thinking about innovation and future, how all of this will change our, our world. And, and that's a really, uh, great analysis. I think we have time for one last question, and I feel like I'm about to ask you to pick your favorite. Um, so take this as you'd like it. 
what are some of the most amazing innovations that already exist that you have worked with personally? Um, I think what we've done, yeah, over the past couple of years, what, what has happened certainly in, in surgery um, and imaging have been extremely important. Imaging um, to be able to, yeah, imaging and, and I should say early detection. Let's start with that. Early detection, um, CT scan of coronary artery, I think is a, a hands down fantastic uh, option. Again, not super new, um, but uh, is very good, a very good way to detect if you have early heart disease. Precision medicine, um, using blood tests uh, to um, find um, things that you wouldn't know about otherwise to help you decide on meds, et cetera. I think it's still in its infancy on the genomic side. I'm very intrigued by proteomics, um, but I think that, that those still have some time, but imaging right now is, is a hands down easy one. On the surgical side, the ability to do not, you know, essentially you know, minimally invasive surgeries, what those guys are able to do it, are, is flat out amazing. The you know, people who can sur you know, survive surgery um, because of that, um, and have minimal um, uh, repercussions afterwards has been great. Someone who's, I've had uh, my appendix out uh, and uh, you know, nine hours later, 13 hours later, so I was, I was out of the hospital. I mean, that is amazing stuff um, that we're seeing right now. But as I, it, you know, in terms of the future, I think uh, there's a lot more to come. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and discussion. We are amazed by you and, and so proud that you are a graduate of UIC and sharing your time and knowledge with us today. Um, so thank you, Dr. Berkowitz. Uh, just wrapping us up next week, it will be our 25th uh, UIC Alumni Exchange event since we started this effort this past April. We have an exciting program lined up and hope that you will join us on Wednesday, September 30th at noon Central Standard Time for an interactive discussion on COVID-19, looking back and looking forward, which will feature our um, own professor from the director of the Division of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the UIC School of Public Health, Dr. Ron Hershaw. Dr. Hershaw has been involved with COVID-19 research and contact tracing in Chicago communities and on our UIC campus. As always, you can find more information at go.uic.edu backslash alumni exchange. And of course, please be on the lookout for that short survey I mentioned at the beginning of the program. Thank you again, Dr. Berkowitz, for this wonderful conversation. We're so grateful to you for all of your time and for all the incredible work that you are doing. Thank you to all of you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at a future Alumni Exchange program. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you.